a bunch of problems on this problem set to make up for the relative lack of problem sets in the past number of weeks. But um, uh, as usual, do whichever ones you enjoy. If you're gonna, uh, if you're interested in working on this stuff, at some point you'll. Some of the problems are easy. Some of them are uh, less easy. Um, none of them are very hard, but at some point you should be able to like do all these problems. Um, and when you really start working on it, you'll start. I think most of these problems. Well, there are some that you can't do in your sleep, but uh, but um, most of them you'll eventually be able to do in your in in, in your sleep. Um, they're they're mostly there just to. Uh, to force practice on some of the uh, on some of the uh, projective geometry, but also um, I had some uh, uh, some derivations that we'll need uh, for the class, especially today. I've left for the problem set. Okay, so um, so we're going to continue to introduce some of the ideas that are going to be uh, important to us. So today I'm going to talk about projective polytopes and canonical forms. Um, and let me begin by uh, just quickly reviewing what we talked about last time. Um, last time we were talking about uh, uh, the fact that, that the notion of a volume makes sense. Uh, as an affine notion, if I give you a hyperplane at infinity, then uh, I can talk about uh, for example, the, the area of a triangle, if I give you the vertices, let me just call them today w1, w2, w3, and some y uh, as a line at infinity, then there's a formula for the area. Your high school formula for the area, uh, written projectively, looks like this. <coughs> we also gave a formula, if you give me the lines, L1, L2, and L3, or I sorry, I, forgot, I called the line Z's last time, Z's, Z1, Z2, and Z3. And again, some Y. Then the formula for the area was 1, 2, 3 squared over Y1, 2, Y2, 3, Y3, 1. No, no, this is Y still, still a line. So I still have. Uh, I'm just, this is two different formulas for the area of a triangle where I've given you the data of the corners of the vertices or the data of the edges. Okay. We also drew pictures, and we, we did it just so we got used to it because today we're going to be uh, uh, playing in this uh, dual space more. We also drew duals of these pictures. So the uh, duals of these uh, pictures, uh, for example, the uh, dual of this second picture is to have a bunch of vertices z1, z2, and z3. And we said that if y was a point that was outside this triangle, what well, was a line that was outside uh, the triangle there, and then, then in the dual, y is a point that is inside this triangle. And we also talked about the fact that we could ask about questions of areas of uh, uh, more complicated shapes than the triangles, and that we could get this by uh, by triangulation. So, for instance, if we look at this quadrilateral, uh, where um, where this line is the line one, this line is the line um, two, three, and four. Uh, let me just make sure that I'm labeling it the way I did last time, just so. Oh, sorry, let me label it like this. So, one, two, this is a line two, that's a line one, this is a line three, this is a line four. That we could, uh, that we could think and so here's y out here somewhere, um, that, uh, that we can get the area for this triangle, for example, as the, uh, as the sum of the area of this triangle or of that triangle. Or that's one way of doing it. That's an internal triangulation. Or we can think of as the difference of this big triangle minus the little one. Okay, so we, 
And I said this part a little quickly um, last time, so let me just say it a little more slowly again. I just want to interpret these two triangulations uh, I want to, uh, from, the, from the dual point of view as well. Okay, so, so, from, so, so let me draw a picture, and it's dual. So let's say we have, um, uh, so let's say we, we have a picture um, with the corners one, two, three, four. And I'm going to I'm going to uh, uh, um, I'm going to triangle this as one two three plus one three four. But so let me just put this uh, uh, line in there. And let's say y is in here. Okay. Okay. So let's draw what the dual of this picture is. Okay, so the uh, dual of this picture uh, now it's going to have a bunch of lines. One two. Ah, so actually, let, let's, uh, let's, let's do it in steps. It's actually fun to do it in steps. So let's first just look at this uh, triangle. For, for, uh, forget about point 0.4 in a second. So um, uh, let's forget about this point for a sec. So I'm going to have some, some, uh, some point here. Let me just call it P for now. Okay. Um, so what does this turn into on the other side? Well, I have a triangle with sides 1, 2, and 3. All right. So where's P in this picture? P is outside somewhere. All right, but um, where should I put it? Uh, uh, where should I put it outside? Well, uh, just let's, let's think what happens as P gets super close to this line 1, 3. What does it mean for P to get super close to the line 1, 3 in the dual? It means that P is a line that is coming super close to passing through that vertex 1, 3. Okay, so y somewhere here means that you know, I should, well, that's maybe too close, but I want to draw it out here somewhere. Okay? So th this is p. So what happens is I move p first on that line and then over here. So what is this? this uh, so if this is a point p1, what is this point p2? This point p2 is now slicing off that corner. All right, so, that's, so that's p1 and that's, that's p2. OK? So already, then we can uh, see the following general amusing thing. And of course, this is very, uh, uh, very standard in going from, from, a, from a picture to its dual. So like, what happens if I, uh, if I add this point now outside? So in the original picture, by adding a point outside, I've made the polygon bigger. <laughs> Right? I'm talking about a bigger polygon. So I've added now a fourth point here. So I have one, two, three. I've added a fourth point. In this picture, what have I done when I added the fourth, fourth point? I had one, two, three, and I've made it smaller, right? Because I've like sliced off a lop of it, which was uh, which is this line four. Okay. Okay. Now. Um, and now let's think about how these two spaces are, uh, let's think about how the triangulations are uh, related to each other. Um, so, because of course it's points in this space, points in this space or lines in this space and vice versa. Okay? Yeah. So, yeah. 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 When you're talking about dual Yes. No, 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 no. This is this is just in projective space. This is not that uh, dual. This is just some P two, and it's a dual where we replace points with lines and lines with points. Okay, so this is much more trivial. It's just indices, whether you think of the indices upstairs or downstairs. Okay, so this is not the. Uh, this is within just uh, within uh, within a uh, one projective space. Okay. So. Um, so uh, what 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 we said uh, quickly last time. I just want to say uh, slowly again which is that if you give me a triangulation of a polygon, it also gives me a triangulation of the dual polygon. But it gives it in, a, in an interesting way. Precisely by, I mean, the dual is getting smaller, right? So here, when I triangulate, I'm adding things. But in the dual, I'm subtracting things. And so, but let's just see uh, uh, how that works. So I, I want to claim that if I draw this picture, um, uh, having triangulated this polygon, it tells me how to triangulate this one. But what that means is that 
uh, I, all the points inside this space, all the points in here, are the lines that are outside the polygon in this picture. Right? So what we're saying is that if I take all the lines that are outside the polygon in this picture, there are those lines that are outside the triangle 1, 2, 3, as well as those lines that are outside the triangle 1, 3, 4. So I have to intersect those things, not add them. You see, there are two conditions. I have the lines be outside 1, 2, 3, and have the lines are outside 1, 3, 4. Okay, so let's just see what that means. So, uh, so if I go back to this picture now, what in this picture are those things that correspond to lines that are outside uh, 1, 2, 3? The lines that are outside 1, 2, 3 are all the points that are inside 1, 2, 3 here. All right. And um, so, and again, let's say, let's say that I put y here. Okay. Remember, this is now 1, 2, 3, and uh, 4. And if I put sort of y, uh, if I put y, um, well, well, we'll now see where, uh, where to put y in this picture. So um, uh, now, what are all the points that are, uh, that don't intersect 1, 3, 4? All the lines that don't intersect 1, 3, 4. In this picture, all the lines that don't intersect 1, 3, 4 are in here. So for example, y, we just decided, y is some line like this guy. Okay. y certainly is something which, um, uh, um, so there are lines that don't intersect 1, 3, 4 that pass through y. That one, lots of lines that don't intersect 1, 3, 4 that pass through y. So that means that in the dual picture, the line y has got to cross through the region of all the, of all the points that correspond to the lines that don't intersect 1, 3, 4. Okay? So what I'm doing is taking the intersection of these two pictures. So I have two conditions. The lines both have to be outside 1, 2, 3, as well as outside 1, 3, 4. The ones that are outside 1, 2, 3 correspond to the points inside this triangle. The ones that are outside 1, 3, 4 corresponds to the points in that triangle. Okay. And y passes through 1 um, and, uh, as, is, uh, as corresponds to this uh, picture. So, so someone asked last time how it was that, that y uh, had to belong to one triangle or the other. And the point is that this, this triangle, that sort of the, uh, the, uh, 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 the dual of things in this triangle is not that little region. It's this complement region. Uh, but the intersection of the big one and the little one is exactly the same as the big triangle minus the little one, okay, which is what, what, we, what we drew uh, geometrically to begin with. So that's why when you triangulate a polygon, or in general if you triangulate a polytope, it induces this sort of inclusion-exclusion uh, triangulation of the dual of the polytope, and vice versa. And so in this way, you, you can get uh, uh, two qualitatively different um, uh, sorts of triangulation. Of course, you can get lots of other triangulations as well, but uh, we're going to be uh, referring to those um, a lot. Uh, no, it's not the stickler. I mean, just, just this, uh, I mean, we just, um, uh, no, I mean, it's just, uh, it's just that, uh, uh, that, uh, Saying that you have a point inside this means that you can uh, means that, for example, y12, y23, and y31 are all positive, right? So that means in this picture that y is some line, and the point 1, 2, 2, 3, and 3, 1 are all on the same side of that line. Okay. So we're gonna we're going to come to that in a little bit more uh, more detail. But okay, all right. So I just wanted to make that point once, and uh, you can play for yourself. 
just to see uh, how it works for, for the case of a pentagon, it's, it's, it's exactly the same thing. Um, but I just want to say that a little more slowly because I did it, said it very quickly last time. All right, so now we're going to switch gears and, um, and talk about something else. So, so uh, what, what we've seen so far is that if you give me some geometric shape and you give me some hyperplane at infinity, there's some natural, interesting, rational functions that I can associate it with these. These volumes are interesting rational functions. And last time we saw they had interesting poles and interesting zeros as well. Okay. So now I want to, uh, I, I want to, uh, um, oh, actually, before switching gears, uh, I want to talk about um, differential forms on projective space. Because we still haven't justified that these things are actually volumes, right? That we just appealed to the fact that you recognize a formula from the high school formula for area. I want to now write it as in, uh, just, just tell you how you're supposed to think about it as an actual volume. So our, so our next topic is differential forms um, in, in projective space. <coughs> OK. And uh, let's, let's first uh, do this in the most naive way. So um, imagine you wanted to um, integrate something on P1. So I want to integrate uh, something on P1. So I have some two-dimensional vector x. So i runs from 1 to 2. And um, you know I might have some uh, interesting function. I don't know, something like. Uh, a, B over X, A, X, B. Then what I would do as a physicist is I would say, ah, I want to integrate over projective space. It's a two-dimensional space. So it's integral D squared X. And then there's this thing, A, B over X, A, X, B. And I'm very happy because all the weights work out properly. Right? But I'm unhappy because, of course, uh, if I literally think of this as an integral, it has this infinity associated with the overall scale of x. Right? So in other words, we have the gauge redundancy under rescaling x. So the physicist's way of writing this is d squared x mod gl1. Right? Let me put quotes around this. And we know what we mean by this in practice. For example, if we gauge fix, so we can, we can say it very pretentiously a la Fadeev Popov, but uh, let's be less pretentious. So if we gauge fix and we say that x is like 1, uh, I don't know, some little x, then we know what we mean by this d squared x mod gl1 is really a 1 form and is just dx. Right? Just, uh, just, uh, just the, uh, the uh, differential on the space. Now, there's actually nothing wrong with this notation. It's a little bit funny looking because it's a one form, but you're writing it as something that looks like a two form and so on. There's nothing wrong with this uh, uh, notation. But let me say this, uh, let me say this uh, a, a little bit better, a little bit more invariantly. And the a little bit more invariant way of saying it is that uh, any, any form on P1 actually looks like any, any uh, two form on P1 um, actually looks like omega is equal to the following interesting, sorry, any one form, x dx times something of weight minus 2 in x. So in other words, the measure on P1 is this interesting object, x wedge dx. Okay? So first, let's just see that this is actually correct. Right? So if I put, so if I go to my coordinates, like x is one, uh, uh, capital X is one little x, then dx is zero and dx. And so x dx is indeed equal to d, d little x. OK? And of course, it's nice because I can choose another coordinate chart. I can say x is uh, you know, y1. And then I'll get dy or minus dy, right? So x dx is minus dy. Okay. So this way of writing the form uh, is manifestly SL2 invariant because I'm just contracting things with the uh, with the with the epsilon symbol, and it lets me choose any gauge I like, right? I don't have to. You see, if I write it like this, I have to pick a particular gauge fixing and say in that gauge fixing is given by that guy. 
Whereas this is slightly more invariant, right? I just give you, give you the expression that's, that's valid everywhere for any gauge fixing you'd like to make. OK? But let's understand why it has to have this form. And um, let's just uh, start off before giving a formal proof. Let's try something else. Like, why does it have to look like that? You might say, well, somehow I have to, by SL2 invariance, I have to contract dx with something. But why can't I contract it with some random other vector? What's wrong with this form? Like um, uh, c dx um, over, I don't know, x d, and then something to make up all the weights. c e uh, d e over uh, c e. So this part doesn't even matter. It doesn't depend on x. But this is, seems like a perfectly healthy form. It's SL2 invariant, right? Um, but there's clearly something very sick about this, uh, about this form, because depending on the gauge fixing I choose for x, the form is non-zero or zero. <laughs> right? So let's say I put c equals 1, 0, and I say that x is equal to y1, then c dx is just equal to 0. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, c, c, c dx is equal to, um, uh, uh, what do I want to do? Yeah, c dx is equal to 0. Whereas if I do it the other way, 1x, then c dx would be dx. So what the heck is going on? The form can't be 0 or non-zero depending on the coordinate chart you chose. right? And uh, the reason is actually very simple to understand. Um, in order for, you see, I'm trying to define a, uh, I'm trying to define a, a, a differential form on, uh, on, on projective space. So let's say I'm thinking about P1. I have all these lines through the origin. So by working with this capital X, I'm you know, really working in this larger space. But uh, when, I, when I care just about uh, 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 when I say that I'm talking about um, uh, the rescaling X goes to TX, and that's perfectly fine for any point on this ray. When we have many points, we say that we have X to TIX. Right, uh, an individual t for every point. So that means that when we're looking to talk about a differential form on projective space, so we have to compare nearby points, then wh whatever form we have should not just be invariant under this with t a constant, but it should be invariant for a local transformation of that sort. Because I should allow myself to do a different rescaling at different points. Okay? So I have to have omega uh, under this uh, shift omega should go to itself. All right? And let's see how that works with this thing, which is good. And now, and after you see that, you can also see that that's the most general thing. So what happens to dx itself? dx itself, under that shift, goes to tdx plus dtx. So the global part is just tdx. So anything, for example, this expression would be invariant under that part if dt was 0. right? But in order for it to be invariant also uh, with any old t, then whatever I do with dx should be invariant if I add to dx anything in the direction of x. And that's why I must contract it with x. Okay, it's only x dx, which just goes into t squared x dx under this shift. Okay. Anything else that I put there will have, will have a shift. All right? And so then all we have to do is multiply by a function of weight minus 2 in order to eat up the uh, t squared, and we're done. All right? So any form on projective space, therefore, any form on p1, so I'm just saying it again, any one form on p1, is x dx f minus 2 of x. And in general, any m form on PM is x dmx, some function of weight m negative n plus 1 in x. OK? All right, so let's. Uh, so let's, let's practice with the sort of simplest form we can write down 
in um, like what's the simplest form we can write down in uh, in P1? Well, if you give me an oh, so so sorry, uh, is it clear what I mean by this d to the mx? I just wedge all the x's together. It doesn't vanish because the d's are all uh, the d's are d's. Okay, so they they they're anti-symmetric. So I'm not. So I'm contracting m dx's with an x, which is a non 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 vanishing thing. Okay. So, okay, so, so let's do, actually, let's just jump to an example in P2. So the very simplest form that, yes? Sorry, you wrote PM there. Sorry, PM. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, here I'm talking about a, a top form. You, you could actually talk about lower forms, and this is the rule, right? So any lower form has to be invariant under local GL1 transformations. And then you can figure out, yeah, so then you have to work out what the, what the, uh, what the consequence of that is. Okay, so here we're just talking about top top forms. Later we'll talk about lower, lower forms too. Yeah, here I'm just talking about top, top forms. All right, so let's say in P2 I give you uh, some point, now I'll switch, uh, yeah, uh, 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 so I have xi and I also give you the uh, data of some yi, so I give you some line at infinity. So what's our first simplest form that we could write down? I could write down x dx dx over x dot y cubed. So that's a perfectly fine, that's a perfectly fine form. And what is this form? Well, if we put y to infinity as usual, so if we say y i is one zero zero, and x is one, you know, little x little y, then then this guy is just equal to our familiar friend dx dy. Okay. So you need a plane at infinity, but then this this object is the sort of uh, is the volume form. Okay, so having defined that, let's now uh, write down a formula for uh, for an area or a volume as an as an integral. So. So let's take our formula where the lines were, were given. Y is the plane at infinity. Then I would say that the integral of this form, x d squared x over x dot y cubed. And now, I have to tell it that I'm integrating my points x inside this triangle now. So that just means that x dot z1 is positive, x dot z2, x dot z1, 2, 3 is positive. Okay, so that's telling me the integration region. So if I integrate this two form over this integration region, I'm supposed to get the formula for the area, which we said was 1, 2, 3 squared over y12, y23, y31. And again, the weight in y matches on both sides. The weight negative 3 in y on both sides. What if instead I give you the data of the vertices, 1, 2, 3? So let's call them W1, W1, W2, and W3. Then I would say it's the integral exactly the same form, x d squared x over x dot y cubed. And now uh, I have to tell you uh, that x is a, and we're going to come back to this in a second, but let's just say it uh, quickly, intuitively now. x is a positive linear combination of W1, W2, and W3 in order for it to be inside this triangle. So these are all the x's of the form, uh, I don't know, alpha 1 w1 plus alpha 2 w2 plus alpha 3 w3, with the alpha is positive. Okay, and that is given by w1 w2 w3 over w1 dot y, w3 dot y. Okay, so these are just the, the, the formulas for an area of a triangle as an, as an integral in, in various ways. Yes? Do you ever experiment trying to get the plane and the area of the plane? No, we're not computing the area of the plane. We're computing the area of the triangle, but in order to talk about the triangle, uh, in order to specify what we mean by the triangle, you have to give a line at infinity. Or a, right. 
We have no metric notions here at all. So what we have are the only notions that you have that are compatible with the uh, uh, fine. Sorry? Well, different choices of y just give you different, uh, I mean, what would the, uh, if you put y to infinity, one, one way of thinking about it is that we're just sort of slicing this, uh, uh, actually, we'll, 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 we'll come to it, we'll, we'll come to it in, in a second. But no, we're not getting anything curved out of this, right? All the symmetries are just the affine symmetries, the things that are, uh, are, are just uh, SL2 cross uh, translations in this case. Yes? Right. Here, this is all real. Here, this is absolutely all real. For, for these notions, it is all real. In fact, we're going to come in a, in a second precisely to something that lets us slide kind of seamlessly from the real to the complex. But if we talk about areas and volumes, it is real. In fact, real, so real, we even care about whether numbers are positive or not. Okay, so, so this is going to be one of the central sort of uh, tensions in this course. So on the one hand, we're going to do a huge number of things in real space with even the word, the notion positivity, playing a big role. On the other hand, we're going to use these things to determine certain complex forms that I'm going to talk about, which sort of live everywhere. And, are, and, are, and, and uh, so, um, so that's one of the interesting things uh, uh, going on. All right. I just want to uh, point out that, um, that you've actually seen some of these formulas before, um, even uh, if you may not recognize them. So let's, uh, let's take this second formula as an example. Okay. So let me say that, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, let me say that I just set w1 to be 1, 0, 0, w2 to be 0, 1, 0, and w3 to be 0, 0, 1, but y to be d1, d2, d3. OK? So again, this is slightly different than what we normally do because we are now, you know, putting data in the line at infinity. Okay. Um, uh, normally we go the other way. We put the line at infinity to some one zero zero. Here we're doing it uh, 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 the other way around. Um, so what is this formula? Well, with this parameterization for x, x d squared x divided by the denominator becomes exactly the integral from zero to infinity. Let's say I can, I can use the, uh, I can. Use the coordinate to set alpha 1 to 1. d alpha 2 alpha 3 over d1 plus alpha 2 d2 plus alpha 3 d3 cubed. That's the left hand side, and the right hand side is 1 over d1 d2 d3. Okay, so this is otherwise known as the Feynman trick. Okay, if you've taken a quantum field theory course, the Feynman trick for combining denominators. Uh, and when you do the Feynman trick, um, it's always annoying. Because you have these alphas, and you have to decide first whether it's Feynman or Schwinger, whether they add up to 1 or not, and then which one to set to 1. Or you do Schwinger, but you've got to choose one of them to go from 0 to infinity, and the other one to set to 1, and so on. That's all because the Feynman trick is the volume of a simplex in projective space. Okay? And all of those different choices are just different ways of, of putting coordinates on, on the projective space. But in fact, if you write it this way, it's much better. Um, and uh, you'll see a lot of relations and things that go to infinity that you have to often worry about in Feynman parameter space are things that are easier to see and so on. Okay? So, uh, and so you see here, it didn't matter who I set to 1. It seems asymmetrical between the three guys, but of course it's not an asymmetrical. That was just the sort of gauge fixing uh, that I did and so on. So the Feynman trick is nothing other than th uh, the formula for the volume of a simplex okay, in uh, projective space. Okay. Any questions about this? All right. So, so far, these are all very, very familiar notions. And now we're going to uh, talk about something slightly less familiar, still extremely elementary, but slightly less familiar, which uh, in these very simple examples is somehow dual to the whole story that we're uh, talking about. Yeah, is there a question? No, no, there's no, that, that's the Schwinger formula, not the Feynman formula. Okay? You can actually write the Feynman formula, too, by, by gauge fixing in a different way. <laughs> you can also gauge fix a uh, projective space where you put all the coordinates, x1 through xn, and gauge fix by demanding the sum as 1. You can, and you can do millions of other formulae, too. Okay? So, but it's all just the same thing. It's the volume of the simplex in that projective space. And the Feynman parameters are parameterizing the inside of a simplex in that projective space. That's, that's, that's what it's doing. All right, so, so now we want to talk about this notion of canonical forms. And I'm going to be sort of uh, informal here. Uh, a little later 
in the course we might uh, define things a little bit more, a little more uh, formally. But um, we, so we've already seen one way to associate interesting functions with some co collection of data, some Zs. I can get these geometric volumes and so on. Now I want to do it another way, and um, uh, let me let me begin with the sort of uh, simplest kind of thing that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about what you can call d-log forms, and I just want to introduce the notation right away. So let's let's uh, or, or the concept right away. Let's just think about the sort of simplest thing: the function of a single variable, um, and I can have like forms that look like dz, z to some power. So these seem innocent, and they don't seem to have any interesting singularities. Um, I can have something that looks like dz over z squared. And that might seem like it has a singularity as z goes to 0. But it's purely a coordinate singularity. right? Uh, you just change variables to z is 1 over w. And this thing is gone. right? This is just negative dw. Okay. So the kind of singularities that actually are really singularities um, are things that look like dz over z. And that's why, I mean, most, most basically, it's because there's no primitive associated with it. You can't write it as the d of something simple, right? You have to write it as the d of a log of z if you wanted to write it as the d of something. And that log z is not well defined on the z plane. It has a branch cut somewhere. Or if you don't want to write it as a d log z, you can detect that there's a singularity there because you can compute a residue by integrating this form around z equals 0, and you get a non-zero answer. OK? So we're going to be very interested in these kinds of forms now as functions of many, many variables. Okay? So we're going to be interested in, uh, in functions of many variables that have logarithmic singularities. So what that means, if you have more than one variable, so let's, let's do a, just, just a very simple example. It'll get more intricate later, but let's already see in, one ver in, in, in two variables. Let's say I give you the function, I don't know, dx, d, uh, the form dx dy over x, y, 1 minus x minus y. Oh, let, let, let's actually, let's, let's stop. Let's first do something simpler. Let's say I give you the form dx over x, 1 minus x. OK? I've just given you a form. But this form kind of secretly knows about a space. Okay, this form, uh, or if I put more generally, just x minus a, x minus b, then already we sort of loosely see that this form is associated, or can be associated, with the interior of this interval between a and b. In what sense is it associated with it? Well, this form has the property that it has the logarithmic singularity at x equals a and at x equals b. And, um, and in fact, those are the only places that has logarithmic singularities. It doesn't have any singularity at infinity. It doesn't have any singularities anywhere else. Right? Actually, I should put an a minus b up here. In other words, I could also write this form as dx over x minus a minus dx over x minus b. In this form, it's manifest that it has a singularity, a logarithmic singularity at x equals a, with logarithmic singularity at x equals b, and again, nowhere else. Now, what if I had put a plus sign there? Is that also OK? That's no longer OK, because this thing does have a logarithmic singularity at x equals a and at x equals b, but it also has a logarithmic singularity at infinity. And so the sum of all the residues add up to 0, but the logarithmic singularity at a and b are plus 1 and plus 1, and there's a minus 2 at infinity. Okay? So I don't like that, um, because it's not really just associated with this interval. It also knows about something at infinity. Okay? So in the absolute simplest case, this is the kind of uh, association that we're talking about. This differential form is associated with this geometric shape the interval between a and b. Okay. And so already here you see the sort of basic tension that we talked about. This is a real picture, a real interval between a and b. 
But associated with this real picture is a certain one form that lives everywhere. You know, the one form is defined in, in the complex in general, if I like. But what's special about this one form is that it has logarithmic singularities on the boundaries of this interval. OK? So we call this one form the canonical form associated with this interval. It's canonical in the sense that it has logarithmic singularities on the boundaries and only on the boundaries of the interval. By the way, how would I write this all uh, projectively? Uh, projectively, at a, um, uh, uh, I would write this as x dx ab over x a x b. So that's now a one form. It has singularities at x equals a and x equals b manifestly. And if I want to manifest that it has logarithmic singularities, I can do that too. And this is actually equal to d log of xa over xb. Now, notice that the whole thing has an orientation. I don't know the overall sign of the form, and that's fine. The interval has an overall orientation that I don't know as well. Okay, so the whole thing is defined up to overall sign, which you can think of as the orientation of the, uh, of the space. OK, now let's, let's go from here to um, our next example. And before writing anything uh, uh, projectively or even saying what the space is, uh, let me write down a form. So here is a form is dx dy over xy, 1 minus x minus y. OK? Now this is a two form. And this two form, uh, we're, we're, we're now going to check to see has interesting properties. OK? So clearly, this two form does have logarithmic singularities in various places, where x, y, or 1 minus x minus y goes to 0. OK? So let's, for example, take a residue on when x goes to 0. And Again, I'm being informal uh, at the moment. And here, it, there is no ambiguity at all in, 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 in uh, what it means. Later, we might talk about the formal definition of multivariate residues and so on. But here, we just have linear factors, so it's totally clear what it means. When you take a residue, if you wanted to imagine you're doing a little contour integral around x, uh, setting x uh, to 0. But in practice, that just sets x equals 0, gets rid of a dx, and I, get, uh, and I just stare at what I'm left. Okay? So I'm going to take a residue around x equals 0. And then what do I get? Well, I'm left with dy over y1 minus y. Because I set x to 0 there, right? But that's cool. This is now a canonical form for an interval between 0 and 1. So we have a, a two form. But the residue on this uh, x equals y gave me the canonical form for an interval that we've seen already. And so we, we can do all of them, right? Obviously. The residue on y equals 0 is going to be similar. Let's do the residue on 1 minus x minus y equals 0. So if I, uh, if I do on the residue on 1 minus x minus y equals 0, then uh, it's like I saw for y is equal to 1 minus x, or the other way around. And regardless, I get dx over x 1 minus x again. OK? So now, in fact, that two form is the canonical form for the obvious triangle. Okay, so here's a triangle. So here's x, here's y, here's the line 1 minus x minus y equals 0. And so once again, we would say that this is our geometric shape, this triangle. right? But with the triangle, we're associating this form. And the special thing about this form is that it has logarithmic singularities on all the boundaries. And now comes the sort of interesting part. is not just co-dimension 1. Co-dimension 1, co-dimension 2, and so on. So you take the residue to go, uh, to go in a co-dimension 1 boundary, you're not done. You have to check if that, in turn, has logarithmic singularities on, on its boundaries, and so on. OK? OK, so, so, so dx dy over xy. 1 minus x minus y precisely has singularities on this uh, triangle. Let's say for the third time, it has co-dimension 1 singularities, like when I say x to 0. And when I take the residue on that, what I'm left with is dy over 1 minus y, which is precisely the form on this interval. 
okay, and so on for all of the rest of them. And there's no singularities anywhere else. Okay? And if I write this more projectively, once again, if you give me, if you just give me uh, the vertices z1, sorry, if you give me these vertices. And now, like, y is a point in here somewhere. So I now want a form in this space where y is a point. I want the canonical form for this triangle. The canonical form for this triangle would be y dy dy 1, 2, 3 squared over y 1, 2, y 2, 3, y 3, 1. Right? That's just what we saw. It has to have poles when y is on the line. 1, 2, when it's on the line 2, 3, and the line 3, 1. And then on those poles, it has to keep, keep going and have correct residues, but it does. Okay, so this is the canonical form associated with this triangle. 1, 2, 3. OK. Now, notice already the interesting similarity between this canonical form and an area, right? Remember, every canonical form in a projective space has to have this y dy dy sitting out in front, right? So it's, it's totally canonical to, to factor that piece out. Every projective, every form, every top form has that piece. So notice that omega of this triangle, whose vertices are 1, 2, 3, and y is a point in here, have, but anyway, y is a point. I'm just indicating that y is a point. Okay. This is equal to y d squared y times the volume or the area of the dual triangle where y is the plane at infinity. Okay. So that's our first sort of interesting correspondence here. We have one very familiar geometric idea of the area or volume of something. But there's another concept, very closely related, but not the same kind of dual, naturally live in the dual space, of a canonical form defined on the space of the line at infinity. <laughs> okay. If you like, I dualize in this space, I have a point, and there's a canonical form that has logarithmic singularities on this triangle, which is actually equal to the volume of the dual of the triangle. OK? All right. Now let's, uh, let's keep going. That's just an observation uh, for the moment. Let's keep going and see if we can determine the canonical form for more interesting shapes. So let's look at the canonical form for this quadrilateral, z1, z2, z3, and z4. OK? And let's first try to do it let's super dumbly directly. OK, so what I want is to find a form in y, which has logarithmic singularities only on and only on the boundaries of this quadrilateral. So let's start doing it. So what could the form be? So well, we, we know we have to have this y d squared y in front of everything. I know, before doing anything else, that it has to have poles on 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, and 4, 1. OK? But just by projective weights, there's something missing upstairs, right? So there has to be some, some line, l i y i. Sorry, I'm now putting the indices on the y upstairs. Right before I was putting it downstairs. But anyway, the y is a point now in this space. So, uh, so y, is, y is a point here somewhere. It doesn't have to be inside. It's, the, it's a form that's defined on this, on this whole space. OK. And 
now we're going to see what the purpose in life of this form is. So uh, the denominator makes it manifest that I have, uh, I have poles when y hits the lines. 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 1. But now let's take a residue when y hits the line 1, 2. So let's say now y is here on the line 1, 2 somewhere. Okay. Okay, then I'm going to have a one form. I went from a two form to a one form. But if I don't tell you anything about the enumerator, where are the places that this remaining one form can have poles? It can have, I'm already on the line y1, 2. So I can have poles when 2, 3 goes to 0, 3, 4 goes to 0, or 4, 1 goes to 0. So what do those correspond to in this picture? If I'm on this line, here is where 4, 1 goes to 0. Well, that's just the point z1. Here is where 2, 3 goes to 0. That's the point z2. But here is where 3, 4 goes to 0. That's this crappy point that I don't like. Right? So this is the point 1, 2 intersect 3, 4. Right? And if I don't do anything else, uh, the form is going to have a non-zero residue there. That's bad. I want it to be a form that only has singularities on this quadrilateral and nowhere else. All right? And similarly, if I go on here, I'll have a bad pole there. And so we learn what the numerator has to be. Right? The numerator has to be this line that puts a zero and then passes through those two points. Okay? So L has got to be 1, 2 intersect 3, 4, 2, 3 intersect 4, 1. Now that's exactly what we saw last time when we looked at the, when we just stared at the final answer for the area of a quadrilateral. But it was somewhat mysterious that we got this zero. Okay? Now from the point of view of the canonical form, it's totally obvious that we have to have these zeros there. So the purpose of the zeros, the purpose of the poles and of the zeros is totally clear. Okay? Without those zeros, this would not be the canonical form of, a, of this quadrilateral. So you see, it's already interesting that already such a simple shape, uh, plonking down the simple shape is forcing you to build this kind of intricate form whose singularities are tied to the shape. Now, just zooming out just for a microsecond to 100,000 feet, scattering amplitudes have a very intricate, very intricate pattern of poles and singularities, which again, we normally learn about by looking at uh, about, uh, what happens when particles go on shell and, uh, and, uh, and sometimes complicated analyses of uh, what all the possible poles are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but part of the point we're going to be seeing uh, more and more in this course is that that entire intricate pattern of uh, singularities is the answer to a natural mathematical problem. <laughs> so you just ask a question in the space of the external kinematical data, and that question knows about this entire intricate uh, pattern of singularities without deriving those intricate patterns of singularities from, uh, from looking at uh, questions about unitarity and the propagation of particles in spacetime. Here we're seeing a super baby version of it, that this rather interesting function, which has an interesting pattern of singularities, is sort of forced on you by this, uh, by this geometric picture. And again, if we want to talk about the canonical form for a pentagon and higher, they're the analogs of the things that we saw before. Okay, so if I want the canonical form for this pentagon, then I would write down something that has five poles downstairs. We, we, we said this also last time, except thinking about uh, uh, the volume instead. So I have to have some conic here, cij, yi, yj. And that conic is exactly the conic that puts a zero that passes through these five bad points where we don't want to have singularities. I go through these, and so you, you can do the analog of this uh, for any n-gon. And I go through it in this case, um, because this is really the only case where, uh, where we can easily, directly from the definition of the canonical form, determine it. In general, it gets more and more intricate. Uh, but these are the simplest cases where we can actually directly determine it. Now, a general point, again, is that the canonical form for a polygon, so let me just write it, for y uh, and a polygon p is y d squared y times the volume or the area of, so y is a point. Now y is the plane of infinity of p dual. So this, uh, this is a, 
Uh, this, is, this is a general fact. Um, now let me try to actually motivate this general fact. So let's go back to this quadrilateral uh, and try to find uh, the form for this quadrilateral in a different way. You see, it's tempting uh, to look at this picture and just triangulate the uh, quadrilateral. Note this is not a volume. This is not an area, right? So I'm not talking about an area in this space. It's an area in the dual space. But in this space, um, we're not talking about an area. Nonetheless, um, nonetheless, the following looks, looks reasonable. That if I look at the canonical form for the triangle 1, 2, 3, plus the canonical form of the triangle 1, 3, 4, this is probably the canonical form for the whole thing, 1, 2, 3, 4. Why is that? Well, let's look at, let's look at the sort of pieces. The, the canonical form for 1, 2, 3, it has a residue when y lies on the line 1, 2. And on that residue, it's correctly given by what it should be on this side. So that one's good. That one's good. From the other side, 3, 4 is good, and 1, 4 is good. The thing which is bad is that 1, 2, 3 also has a spurious pole, right? As the spurious singularity when y, y lies on the line 1, 3. But that's the whole beauty of these canonical forms, okay? is that it's true that it has a spurious singularity there, but what is the residue there? The residue there is just the canonical form for 1, 3. See, now it forgets where it came from. It doesn't know about 2. It doesn't know about anything else which is there. The residue on 1, 3 is just the form with singularities on, the, on 1 and 3. That's exactly the same as the same residues you'd get from the other side, from 1, 3, 4. Okay, so then all you have to hope is that the signs work out. And of course, if you orient the triangles correctly, or you add them literally in this way with 1, 2, 3, and 1, 3, 4, uh, corresponding to orientation, then the, the residues cancel from both sides. But you see, it's clear that there's a chance for the residues to cancel from both sides, because the residue doesn't know where it came from. right? It, that the residue on the line 1, 3 only knows about what's going on on the line 1, 3. Okay? So this, just, this tells you that this uh, construction um, has logarithmic singularities on and only on the boundaries of the quadrilateral and nowhere else. Now, to really finish the story, I have to prove to you that if I have two forms, so th this gives you some form with logarithmic singularities. How do you know it's like, how do, how do we know there isn't more than one of them? Well, in these simple cases, but it's also true more generally, there's a unique form uh, that has logarithmic singularities. If, if there's any at all, it is unique. And this is essentially because in a projective space, there is no form that has singularities nowhere. Okay? Every form has a singularity somewhere in projective space. The, the sort of dumbest way of thinking about it is just write down any form. You write down some x dx dx. Something's got to make up the weights of the x downstairs. So there is some expression downstairs. Any rational form is going to have singularities somewhere. Okay? All of these, all, both the forms and the residues and all the facets are simply forms on some projective space of some dimension. And uh, therefore, if you have two forms whose singularities agree, if you subtract them, the form has got to be 0, because there are no forms that have no singularities anywhere. Okay, so that's the, 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 uh, the quick argument. Um, that uh, if such a form exists, it's unique. We just built it, so it's unique. OK? So I, I'm going through this. All, it's all very simple, but, uh, but I want to stress again, these are two slightly different things, right? Here we're triangulating the space, and the triangulation is giving us a way to build a form by summing the canonical forms of the pieces. And the fact that, that it works is, of course, related to the fact that the triangles snugly cover the space. Right. Um, on the other hand, we just saw that, exact, that a triangulation of the, uh, of the quadrilateral also induces a triangulation of the dual quadrilateral. And then if I strip off the y d squared y from this formula, then what this expression is, is also a triangulation of the, of the area of the dual quadrilateral. Okay, so these are two different ways of understanding that this is giving you the, uh, the, uh, the uh, canonical form, and also a way of seeing that the canonical form is, in fact, the area of the dual, after you subtract the y d squared y. OK. okay. 
Any questions about this? In fact, if you want to, uh, um, uh, it's, it's kind of fun to, uh, to say what we're saying uh, in the following slightly more symmetrical way. So imagine I have my space of points in some projective space. So y, dm, y. I'll now, uh, well, let's just say it in uh, two dimensions. We haven't talked about polytopes yet. So let's say I have uh, y d squared y. And I have the space of, maybe these are lines and points. It doesn't matter. And something dual, x d squared x. And so I can have this nice form which is defined on both spaces, so the space of lines and points, dually, right? Now, if I integrate x on the inside of some polytope I'll call p dual, right? What is this integral? Well, that's just what we saw as the volume. So that's the volume of p dual, with y as the plane at infinity, right? So, but when that thing multiplies y d squared y, I get the canonical form for p. All right, so there's this sort of nice form that lives on the product of two spaces, of points and planes. If I integrate on the inside of one inside some polygon, I get the, the canonical form of the dual of the polygon. Nice rational canonical form. Okay. You can actually ask an amusing question. Um, what happens if I integrate both of them? So I put y inside its own polygon. I put x inside the uh, dual of some polygon. Now I get some interesting function, which depends on these two polytopes, p and q two polygons, P and Q. These things are known as Aomoto polylogarithms. <laughs> so later in the course, when we start talking about polylogs and motives and things like that, this is going to be the sort of beginning, right? So in the very, very simplest case, um, if you just have the integral over an interval of the canonical form for another interval, you get a log. And the log is actually pairing this interval with the other one. So you can really think of it as, uh, as, as a pairing between these two spaces. And all of the complicated identities that polylogarithms satisfy are simply triangulation. You, you triangulate the square in two different ways. You triangulate another square in two different ways. And you get all the interesting identities that are satisfied. That's just a peak for uh, quite a bit later in, in the course. We're not going to be talking about these, these things now. But just if you were curious, these things are called Aomoto polylogs. OK. OK, so now we've, we've now seen another way that if you give me, uh, another way that if you give me some, um, give me some geometry, so, and for reasons that will become more clear in a moment, you sort of call these things positive geometries. But really, loosely, it's some space P that has uh, boundaries of all co-dimension. And associated with this space is a, uh, is a canonical form, omega canonical, that depends on whatever ambient space P lives in and also depends on P, has logarithmic singularities on all the boundaries of P. <coughs> the cases we've seen with polygons, and shortly we'll talk about polytopes, um, are are very simple and familiar, but uh, well, they're they're not they're, they're 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 simple. I think they're they're not entirely standard even uh, in the math literature. Um, but uh, we'll be looking at cases where these spaces get a lot more intricate. Uh, so they're not just cut out by linear equations. They have some nonlinear structure. These spaces will live in Grassmannians, and that that's and then then these objects get a lot more uh, uh, a lot more. Interesting, although there's already interesting even in this very simple case. OK, any questions? Yes? Well, so I mean, just like what we saw in our example. So we have a polygon, and it has uh, boundaries. Uh, because I want to be able to take residues 
uh, I have some top form, and I want to be able to take residues all the way down to zero forms. Okay? So in the case of the polygon, uh, if the polygon itself is two-dimensional, it had one-dimensional boundaries, and it has zero-dimensional boundaries, the corners. If I'm going to talk about some more complicated three-dimensional shape, it has to have two-dimensional boundaries, the facets, one-dimensional boundaries, edges, and corners. Okay? So what would not work is something just like, here's a simple example. I just have a sphere, a nice two-dimensional shape. There is no canonical form associated with a sphere. What would I write down? I might write down dx dy over 1 minus x squared minus y squared. Great. I'm stuck, right? Now that there's, there's nothing I can do. Uh, at that, so so there, there, there's no, uh, um, well, yeah. Okay, so, um, uh, so it has to have boundaries of all, of all, uh, of all dimensions. Anyway, we, we, uh, so far we're just talking about polygons and, and, their, and their cousins, uh, polytopes. Okay. All right. So, um, so now we've seen various ways that we can take geometric regions and associate interesting objects with them. Um, actually, let me just pause right here. So if you give me a polygon, then the canonical form associated with the polygon is one nice way of getting it would be to triangulate, as we've talked about a number of times. You can triangulate any way you like, but one way is to triangulate like this. So this would be the canonical form for 1i, i plus 1. And so this is y d squared y times what I could call this bracket 1i, i plus 1, where, as we as we defined a number of times, in general, 1, 2, 3 would be uh, uh, 1, 2, 3 squared over y, 1, 2, y, 2, 3, y, 3, 1. sum over i. <clears throat> so I think uh, uh, before moving on to talking about general polytopes, I uh, want to illustrate already in this case um, how we finally go from these objects to things that uh, we would associate with amplitudes. Okay, so uh, remember we remarked a number of times the similarity between this bracket and the corresponding kind of bracket that we'd write for a superamplitude. Okay, so, so the bracket we'd write for our toy version of the superamplitude um, that only differed from the, uh, the real one just by having fewer indices, so there's really no, no real difference. Um, so, so the SUSY amplitude uh, looks like this 1, 2, A to 3 plus 2, 3, A to 1, 2, 3, A to 1 plus 3, 1, A to 2 squared or delta squared divided by 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1. So we've said many times that these things kind of look similar. And now I want to tell you the precise correspondence between the uh, two of them. And let me tell it to you in, in one kind of mechanical way, uh, which is the first way that uh, people ran into it, and then a much more, uh, a, a more important and more beautiful uh, intrinsically geometric way, which will be closely related uh, to each other. So first, let me tell you the, the totally mechanical way. So there's a y sitting here. So there, there, there are two differences between these expressions. One of them is that here, the z's are three vectors. Here, the z's are two vectors. Here, there's a y. Here, there's eta's. <laughs> okay, so, so now we're going to just uh, match these to each other in the following way. Y, no matter what Y is, I can, by an SL3 transformation, bring it to the form 1, 0, 0. Uh, let me sit, put it the other way for once. 0, 0, 1. And then when I do that, the Zs, uh, I can just naturally divide into the pieces that are in the upper 2 by 2 block and something which in, is in the lower block. Let me call the piece in the zero, uh, lower block uh, Xia. What is a geometric interpretation of these ZAs? If you think about why, if you go back for a second to the whole, uh, 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 to, uh, to thinking about these Ys as a vector in a three-dimensional space, 
So I have y some vector, z are some vectors. So what does it mean geometrically to, to say that if y is pointing in some direction, I only care about the other directions? Well, it's what I would see when I project it in the direction of y. Right, so if I project in the direction of y, then what's left is what I'm calling the little z. So, so that's the invariant way of saying it, instead of saying that I put y to 0, 0, 1. Really, the little z are the, uh, are the picture that I'm left with uh, after I take the big z's and I project in the direction of y. OK? We'll come back to that interpretation in a second. OK, but having done that, what does this formula look like? What does our formula of the y look like? Our 1, 2, 3 is just, well, the downstairs is really easy. The downstairs is just the two brackets made out of these little z's. Right? Because just the y is sitting there, and so all these determinants are just the little uh, determinants made out of the, of the z. What is the numerator? Well, this is a big determinant, right? It's a big determinant for z1, z2, z3. So 1, 2, 3 is just this determinant, z1, c1, z2, c. Sorry, they look so similar. z2, c2, z3, c3. So what is this? This is C1 two times that determinant 2, 3 plus the cyclic. C2, 3, 1 plus C3, uh, 1, 2. OK, and so therefore our object is So 1, 2, 3 is C1, 2, 3 plus cyclic squared over 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1. So far, everything is perfectly bosonic. There's nothing, nothing fancy going on. We're just dividing, naturally dividing the z's into the part that in the direction of y and the part that's orthogonal to, to, uh, to, to y. And now, now, comes the, now comes the interesting part, is that what we want to do is sort of demand that the Xs are actually infinitesimal. In other words, we want some sufficiently high power of Xe to vanish. Okay. So said another way, I want to write Xca as some phi dot eta a, where now this has an index that runs from 1 to 2. So there are two of these guys. Okay. There's phi that runs from 1 to 2, and eta that runs from 1 to 2. And I want phi and eta to both be Grassmann variables. Okay. So phi and eta are Grassmann. So still nothing has, has changed. Phi dot eta is still bosonic. So this is just. There's a single phi dot eta 1, 2, 3, plus cyclic squared. And now comes the final step. If I take d squared phi, the Grassmann d squared phi of this object after doing this identification, I precisely get the super amplitude object. OK, so this is the connection between the canonical form and supersymmetry. The canonical form is kind of Bose-Eye supersymmetry. Y is giving me space, this extra, the, 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 first the z's are higher dimensional vectors. There's a one higher dimensional vector. I have to decide which the components are, the directions that I care about, and which ones aren't. But y does that. So there's y there that, that says I care about uh, the, the things in the direction of y and not in the direction of y. The things not in the direction of y are the ordinary twisted variables that we care about. The other directions you say are actually is where the super stuff lives. Okay? So, and you just declare that they're infinitesimal. You write them as phi dot eta, and then you integrate over phi. Okay? So that's a, that's a procedure 
that takes you from a canonical form to a superamplitude, or something that looks like a, a superamplitude. Okay. So if I repeat in this case, if I repeat in this case uh, uh, what I'm doing, I have my canonical form, which depends on this uh, polygon. This is y d squared y times some function of weight minus 3 in y and all the z's. I set y equal to uh, 0, 0, 1, z a to uh, little z a and phi dot a to a, and then a after I do all of that, d squared phi of this function is the amplitude, is the superamplitude that depends on the z's and the eta's. In this case, it's our toy superamplitude that we talked about. Okay? Huh? The volume. Or, or it's the, yeah, I mean, you, you, yeah, oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, let me just leave it. I don't even need, let me not put the weight even, it doesn't matter, yeah, okay? Um, okay, so that's, that's, that's the first way, okay, so that's, uh, so that seems like a kind of involved procedure. Um, there's a purpose in life to every piece, the kind of, uh, so again, the extra components in the Zs are giving you room for the helicities to live and uh, for, for the, uh, for, for the eta's to live and so on. But I want to tell you a second way of thinking about it, and, thi th and th this way is uh, quite a bit deeper. It's actually the correct way. And after I tell you this way, I can actually, uh, well, let, let, me, let, me, let me first say it. Okay, so in order to do it, let's actually go back to the omega for a triangle for one, two, three. Okay, and, and remember, well, it was what it was. So it was uh, y d squared y, 1, 2, 3 squared. But we also said that it was, we could write it as a, as a d log form. And so here I can do it two ways, and you'll do this explicitly in your problem set, but this should not surprise you that you can uh, write it as two d logs like that. And again, it, it looks like I'm breaking the symmetry between the lines, but I could put any one downstairs here that I want. Okay, so they're all, they all give you uh, the same expression. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's, that's nice. And in this way of thinking about this, this omega is a form on y space, right? Good. So here it is, d log, d log, and the d's are hitting the y. But now let's just relax and play a little bit. Okay? What if I thought of that differential as actually acting on everything, not just y? Right. Let me think of that differential as acting on everything. It could act on y, it could act on z's. In fact, let me pull out of this thing the part of this differential that only acts on z's. What would that look like? Well, it's not acting on y at all, right? So the part that's only acting on z's is going to be what? It's going to be some form that's only defined on the space of z's after you project through y. Is that clear? Right? Because y is just a dummy sitting there. There's a y in front of everything. And so, um, so in other words, this is exactly, if, if, if y is fixed, if y is fixed, then, so for instance, let me literally put y equal to 0, 0, 1 again, as we did before, and z to be some z and c, then the point is that this is d log of just 
the, the, the things made out of the Zs. Is that clear? Right? So just, just putting it in, right? The, the only things that, that show up here are y is gone. And who are these guys? They're exactly the, what I get after I project through y. So this is cool. We have a two-form on literally the space of the two-dimensional variables that we care about. OK? It's a differential form on the space of the two vectors, that a. And this is a non-trivial little exercise. It's not hard, but you'll do it on your problem set. But this is the cool thing, is that, in fact, d log this two form, 1, 2 over 1, 3, d log 2, 3 over 1, 3, is equal to 1, 2, dz3 plus cyclic is this two form squared over 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1. In other words, it's exactly the super amplitude. On the nose, the super amplitude, with no moving around and shifting and integrating or anything. On the nose, the super amplitude, but where the Grassmann variable eta is replaced by dz. <laughs> so you want to know why anti-commuting things show up? Because you're talking about a differential form. That's why. Okay? So we've completely bosonized supersymmetry in this way of talking about things. So Susie is just forms, right? That the, yeah, it's just wedge. So these things are just, and they're wedged when they're a Grassmann as well. Okay, so it's just exactly the same thing. So, so if you take this expression and you replace the dz's, which of course you can do, dz i i replaced by a to a, this is the super amplitude. Okay. So now we have a different object. So you see, th this, is, this is interesting. On the space of the kinematic variables, on the space of the z's, on the space of the two-dimensional z's, we have a two-form. Not in y space. This is a little more, slightly more abstract, right? This is now in the space of all z's. In this giant space of all z's, I have some two-form. So there's a two-form, which is one way of writing it is a sum over i, d log. 1i over ii plus 1, d log 1i plus 1 over ii plus 1. There are many ways of writing it, right? So there's this two form that lives on the kinematic space of the external data. And now what's special about this two form? Well, we somehow want to say that this, is, this two form is the canonical form for a polygon. But where the hell is a polygon? <laughs> There doesn't seem to be any polygon here. Um, well, we'll talk about where the polygon is uh, next time. Okay? But let me give you, let's give a clue to think about where the polygon came from. Um, let's go back and uh, back in the original picture where we had y's. Imagine that the underlying z's were fixed, but we moved y around. You see, we saw a form in the space where we moved y around. Now, what would that look like if we projected through y? If we projected through y, we would start with some set of z's, and then as we move y around, this projected set of z's would also move around in some way. So in other words, what we're doing is we're identifying in the space of n two vectors, there is some two-dimensional plane that lives in that space. So in the space of n two vectors is a certain two-plane. All right, And the claim is that if you take this form which is defined everywhere on the space of n two-dimensional vectors, and you pull it back to that two-plane, then on that two-plane, this you will see uh, on that two-plane, this would be the canonical form for a polygon that comes to life on that two-plane. OK? That, that, sorry? That's right. The, 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 from this point of view, there's no y. Y is parametrizing. All the way, so all the ways that starting from these three-dimensional z's, you could move y around. From the projected point of view, is taking some set of z's and then moving around in a two-dimensional plane. Okay? So, in so let me repeat: in the full kinematic space. So that that's that's what. But 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 I'll I'll say it once because uh, now this is going to end up being a pretty general picture. In the full kinematic space, there's some interesting region. There's some interesting positive region. 
there's a family of hyperplanes um, in the kinematic space as well. There's a form which has some, some in general, lower than top degree that lives on the whole space. And, um, uh, but the space has a property that, that this, this, uh, this subspace S intersects this region P in a positive geometry. So in this case, it would literally be a polygon. And the pullback of this form to the plane is the form of logarithmic singularities on that geometry. Okay? So I'm just so this is a, this is a sneak peek ahead, like a month and a half. Um, but the story for n equals four super Yang Mills to all loop order is going to be exactly this, right? So we're just going to uh, the, the the space is going to be the space of four-dimensional z, not two-dimensional z. What this big region is is going to uh, is going to say in the space of all z. When I look at what the configuration of Zs look like, they have certain topological properties. They have a certain winding number. Okay. Then on top of that, the amplitude is a 4K form that lives on this space. And that bosonizes supersymmetry, just in the way that we saw before. But it's just a differential form that lives on this space, which has the property that when you pull it back to some appropriate subspace, you reveal a geometry. That geometry will be the amplitohedron. Okay. But it's a way of talking about things directly as we are asking for in the very first few lectures in this class. We want to find a question that lives in kinematic space. No auxiliary objects, directly in kinematic space. And somehow ask a question in kinematic space whose answer is all the richness and complexity of amplitudes in it. And now we're starting to see how to do it. But the ideas involved are going to involve generalizations of what came so naturally for the polygon. For the polygon without thinking, we drew a convex shape and we ordered the vertices in some way as we went around the shape. We're going to have to learn what that means a little bit more invariantly before we can generalize it. Okay? And that's what we're going to start doing next time. Thank you, sir. Sorry again. Uh, oh, oh, good, good. Yeah. What are you doing?